to the Jazz Notes podcast. Ben Anderson, Chandler Holt, October 10th. Jazz have played one preseason game. We're going to talk about the preseason. Uh, we'll touch on your questions. GM survey is out today. We will talk about that. Jazz not mentioned a ton, but in a couple of little spots here and there. A uh, little Drew Holiday stuff with the Utah Jazz as well. And uh, like I mentioned, the mailbag. So uh, fun show today. Excited. And we actually have basketball to talk about, which is always fun. In some ways, it really simplifies the podcast. We uh, have to be less creative. But it's, it's what we're here for. We want to talk about the games, and I'm excited to talk about the games. And the Jazz did get a win over the Clippers. Not that wins or losses matter at all in the preseason, nor does beating a team that rests all their starters <laughs> in the second half, which is essentially what the Clippers did. So uh, I guess, Chandler, we'll start with you. What were your initial thoughts on the preseason? Well, first of all, I just want to say NBA basketball is back. As an NBA nerd, I am giddy for it. I am so excited. But like you said, the Jazz did pull out a win, uh, and the Clippers rested all their players in the second half, and they were winning in the first half, so that may tell you a little bit of something. But um, I think that, that we, we learned a lot of good things. Um, I would say one of the biggest takeaways for me was just the rotation. There was a lot of things that were expected. There were a lot of things that I saw that I was sort of confused about. Um, one of the biggest things we could just touch on this really quick was Romeo Langford. Um, I think that Romeo and Danny Ainge, of course, have this big relationship. He was drafted by him um, when he came into the NBA. And I was, I was expecting him to get spot minutes just because where else do you play him? You know, we've talked about how the jazz guard rotation, everyone's in there fighting for minutes. We don't know who's going to start, who's going to get those backup minutes. Um, and it's like he's not going to play in the regular season unless the game's already right. decided. Well, so. I mean, maybe that's what to read into it is, is that he's just not going to play. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's what I would probably have my initial read be. Again, I thought it was a little interesting last week at Media Day that they made Romeo Langford available and the other two two of the three three-way, uh, two-way players, but didn't make Joey Hauser available. Now, Joey Hauser's actually hurt. He didn't play, but Johnny Juzang didn't play, mm-hmm. right? Am I looking nope, at the... so. I, I, I expect and I look, I check the uh, transaction board at NBA.com every day to see when the Jazz are waving these players. I suspect Romeo Langford and Agenda and all these guys will be waived at some point. Maybe they'll come back from Seattle first and do that. They're playing in Seattle tonight. Uh, I would suspect the Jazz will wave them, or maybe they keep them uh, throughout training camp, uh, throughout uh, the preseason, and they wave them right before the regular season. You can do that as well. There's no real rush. Some teams have different uh, different reasons for doing it. But the, the Jazz don't really have to waive those guys until they get to uh, opening night when you have to trim the roster down to 15 players plus three two-way guys. Performance of the game goes to someone who you've been big on this whole offseason, Chris Dunn. He came in in the second half, shot 7-for-7, seven seven, 15 points. Honestly, a really big reason why the Jazz were able to take the lead and then take the win there in the second half. I'm going to just say it now. I think the Jazz starting lineup is going to be Chris Dunn, Jordan Clarkson, Lowry Markin, and John Collins, Walker Kessler. I think that's the starting five we're going to see on opening night. I think it makes a ton of sense. If the Jazz are serious about winning, if they are not tanking this season, and I don't think they're tanking this season. They didn't tank last year necessarily. They did a points. Don't get me wrong. But, you know, if they're serious about winning, I think that's the starting lineup. I think that's the best team. I think uh, Chris Dunn might be the best guard on the Jazz roster. Let me say that again. Chris Dunn might be the best guard on the Jazz roster. And Jordan Clarkson's really good. And Colin Sexton's really good. Chris Dunn is a great two-way player who scores mega efficiently. He still hit his only three in the game because he made all of his shots. Like, he just does all the things you need a guard to do, and he's a really good passer. And, yeah, he was going against the, the, the B team of the Clippers. I get it. And he still was the best player on the floor and can get a bucket when he wants getting into the paint. Like, I really, really, really believe in Chris Dunn. If he gets waived, like the Milwaukee Bucks sacrifice their soul by cutting one of the tenaces or the 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 Antetokounmpo brothers and make room for Chris Dunn because he could seriously be the tilt in a playoff game where he's like the seventh or eighth guy and he comes in for 10 minutes and scores 10 points like we saw against the Clippers in the preseason. I get that those are two totally different things, but I don't think Chris Dunn is afraid of the moment and uh, they win a game because of Chris Dunn. Like he's that good and the Jazz should hold on to him at all costs. I also think he just has the best fit. I mean, if you look at the other players in that starting lineup, you have Jordan Clarkson, pure scorer. Larry Markkinen, more of a scorer. Same thing with John Collins, and then Walker Kessler holds it down down low. But you need that playmaking, and you need that defense up top when you're surrounded by players like that. Yep, you you do. You just you need defense. You need as much defense and, you, and as many two-way players as you can. And I think Lowry's a two-way player. John Collins might be a two-way player. I'm not sure yet. Uh, and then I know Chris Dunn is a two-way player. Jordan Clarkson tries hard on defense, but he's not a great defensive player. Walker Kessler tries hard on offense, but we saw some of his failed, you know, post-ups. He's still not quite there. He doesn't have a hook shot. He didn't take any threes. Like, all those things that we were wondering if he was going to do, he didn't show in game one. It's early, but he didn't show those in game one. So, 
Uh, that's what I would think, yeah, if you want to look at the guard rotation, I wouldn't read anything into Jordan Clarkson not starting other than they're just trying to, you know, let guys get on the floor and see what Taylor Horton Tucker can do. And actually, I thought Taylor Horton Tucker starting was the biggest indicator that he might not be in the rotation of any because they're like, hey, we don't want him to lose faith in being a part of this team because he's not in the rotation on opening night. So we're going to let him start and play minutes right or really early in the preseason so he at least has like a, a flavor, a taste of being on the floor. But I won't be surprised if Taylor Horton Tucker's not in the rotation on opening night at all. We can touch on John Collins and move on to some of the younger guys. John Collins, he, he played pretty good in 18 minutes. He uh, shot two for three, an alley-oop dunk, and a three-pointer, so showing the best of both worlds there. Yep. Um, and then he added four rebounds. He didn't look bad defensively. He was he was all over the floor. He was yeah. moving well. From what I can tell, like I said, it's just preseason. He only took one shot, but he made it. So maybe the finger isn't bugging him as much. I, I honestly don't know if he's like a rebound-and-go guy the way Lowry Markkinen is. Kelly Olynyk could even do it a little bit last year. Jared Vanderbilt did it. Uh, can John Collins rebound and dribble up the floor and get the team into the offense? Those are the types of things I'm starting to watch. Those are ways for him to get touches. I was a little bit, uh, what's, what's the word I'm looking for? I was surprised to see he only had one shot in the first nine minutes in, on the floor, and then he took the three, like right as I was getting ready to tweet that out. He took a three and he, he knocked it down. But I was like, you know, he's got to get more shots than that. And I think you may have to create shots for him, even if it means adding a wrinkle to the offense that you don't rely on a lot. And I, I wrote about this as well. You may just have to run pick and roll with John Collins and, you know, either Chris Dunn or Taylor Horton Tucker or whoever and just say, hey, John, like we are going to get you three lobs a game. We're going to get you some rolls to the basket. We just we're going to put you in a spot to get offensive touches because we want you to score 15 points a night and get 12 shots. And he just might be a guy you have to find 12 shots for. He won't organically find 12 shots for himself. So I, I will keep an eye on that. That's something I'm curious about. I do think Will Hardy and the Jazz coaching staff was really trying to see, can he play on the floor in between Lowry and Walker? Because that is what's going to be the starting lineup, and what does that look like? Whereas they didn't want to immediately bail out and go to the idea, which I think we've talked about a lot, which is he's going to be the backup big man alongside Kelly Olynyk, and he's going to play off of Kelly. And Kelly, I think, is going to space the floor, and John Collins will sit in the dunker spot and essentially be on offense, the backup five. I think they're trying to avoid falling into that immediately, even though I suspect that's where he'll be. Because they want to make it work with those other guys. If Collins can be a reliable three-point shooter, I'm excited to see the pick and roll between either him and Chris Dunn or him and Colin Sexton, because those are two guards who can come off a screen and put a lot of pressure on the rim. Yes. And then if he can space out, pick and pop, and hit those shots, I think that'll be a nice little fold to the Jazz offense that we maybe really haven't seen. And I'd throw uh, Keontae George into that as well. He would be really good because he's so fast at getting to the rim that if he had a popper instead of a roller, it would make his life easier. And we can move on to Keontae George. He looked really comfortable with the ball in his hands. I was honestly surprised by that. He moved well. He looked like he belonged overall. But I think that his playing time, specifically in the season, will be very dependent on how he can perform on the defensive end. There was a lot of times where he just gave up easy looks. Um, he also didn't have the best shooting night. Um, let me look. He shot two, two for nine, nine yeah. and one for six from three. But he had the highest plus minus on the team, so I guess we can take that with a grain of salt. Remember Keontae George's first half here in Salt Lake City during the summer league? His first summer league game, he was terrible. Like, yes. he was so bad, and he was just, like, hucking shots and was, like, trying to run point guard and, like, looked terrible. It's exactly what he did in the first quarter. He got into the game. He immediately gets backdoored. Next possession down, he has the ball. He's like, well, I'm just going to shoot a three. He gets it blocked, which is blocking threes in the NBA just doesn't happen, especially by another guard. I think it was Bones Highland came in and blocked the shot. He commits a double dribble, which is like the dumbest turnover. You like you get nervous and you pick the ball up and then dribble again. It's just like, I bet you he hasn't had a double dribble since his seventh grade, eighth grade <laughs> AAU game. You know what I mean? Like, that's not a carry. He double dribbled. It's just, it's like a thinking turnover. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then I thought he was actually okay. Now, he he was one of seven from the floor in the second half. He he shot really poorly in the second half still. I'm not worried about his shot going down. His shot will fall at some point. Uh, he showed that in summer league. He's going to be a, a big-time shooter. And you know what? Guards are inefficient. There are still nights when Dame has terrible shooting nights. There are still nights when Booker has terrible shooting nights. Donovan Mitchell, like the best scoring guards in the NBA, still have bad shooting nights. So I'm not worried about that at all. And you're right. I think he just got more comfortable and started to recognize really quickly, hey, this works, this doesn't work. And he was like, well, I can get, I can get out in transition, I can run, I can get to the free throw line and get, and get free throws. And six free throw attempts, you know, he might be the Jazz best player at getting to the free throw line this year already, more than Lowry, more than Walker. I think Walker's going to shoot free throws because teams are going to foul him. 
But, yeah, he knows how to do that, and that, that'll be a strength, and the rest of it will come. I thought he was fine. No worries at all about Keontae George after one game. And I'm, I'm glad that the Jazz are playing the Clippers twice back-to-back -back because they have a lot of good defensive players. I think that's important for a young team, specifically in the preseason, to go against players who you know will bring it on the defensive end. Uh, like you have Paul George and you have Kawhi Leonard. Of course, that doesn't apply to Keontae. But we can move on to Walker. He was going against uh, Ivica well, let's, let's talk about uh, Taylor Hendricks real quick. Oh, yes, yes. Before we move off of the rookies. First of all, and I just tweeted this out, it's so weird to me, this narrative that is developing about Taylor Hendricks online that, like, the Jazz made a mistake with him. Like, he didn't play in summer league because he was hurt, which is r the right answer. Don't play if you're hurt. Yes. That's stupid. Don't play if you're hurt. Walker Kessler didn't play last year. He was hurt. Had a bad toe injury. It was great to start the regular season. Had a double-double in his first game. He was fine. He was just fine. We didn't see him in summer league. That's okay. And then I saw a complaint that Omer Yurtsevin got on the floor b before Taylor Hendricks. Well, first of all, Omer Yurtsevin's a center. And Taylor Hendricks is a four, yeah. and the Jazz wanted to be a three-four, not a four-five. Ideally, he plays a three-four, and by the way, that's way more valuable. The wing power forward is way better than the undersized forward center. It yes. always has been, certainly is now in the modern NBA. So I think the Jazz want to see if he can do that. And I was actually impressed that he dribbled the ball. I don't remember him dribbling the ball hardly at all at Central Florida in the games I watched. Like a little bit in transition, if he like got a rebound and tried to get going quickly. But, I mean, his step back three, whatever, I'm, I don't believe he's going to shoot that shot a lot. Good for him for hitting it. I don't care that much about it. But he grabbed the ball at the three-point line, put the ball on the floor a couple of times. He tripped. He slipped, whatever happened. Uh, but I w was encouraged that he actually had the confidence to dribble. I thought that was good. He runs the floor really easily at six foot eleven. I thought he looked six eleven to me. So he got up and down the court really smoothly. He accidentally grabbed four rebounds, including a big offensive rebound off of a free throw, meaning he, like, will accidentally do the right things. I've talked to you how much uh, about how much I care about rebounders, and I think it's really important, and that's one thing he can do to affect the game quickly. It's a kind of a toughness thing, and if you're not rebounding well, you're going to find yourself in trouble. Uh, so that's a way for him to get onto the floor. I, and then he was thinking. like he's a, It's his first time playing since March when he was playing at Central Florida. He was the best player on the floor. Now he's the 10th best player on the floor, the 5th best player on his own team, and he's out there just, like, trying to not mess it up. And what are you going to do when you're trying to not mess it up? You're going to mess it up. Yeah. And he messed it up a couple of times. He didn't get matched up in transition defensively. He, you know, hucked a three after he made his first one, being like, well, maybe I just hit all these shots now. Like, <laughs> it's fine. It's what it's for. 12 minutes of basketball. He's going to be better tonight. He'll probably play more tonight than he played in the last game. I thought he was just fine. I did not understand this concern that I saw from some fans on Twitter. It's certainly not all of them. Uh but some fans on Twitter, it was just so weird to me to see this narrative emerge when I thought he looked like better than I had expected, in all honesty. I saw some people complaining that his only shot attempts were threes, and he only did play 12 minutes, but what do you think about that? Uh, well, first of all, Chris Dunn took all the shots in the fourth quarter, and if Chris Dunn wasn't shooting, Keontae George wasn't shooting, and if Keontae George wasn't shooting, Luka Shamanich was definitely shooting. <laughs> like, Luka got on the game and was like, watch this! I'm going to make this roster! I'm going to get all these shots. And by the way, Luca was good. He was. He I actually really thought Luca was better than Simone Fontecchio. Like, I might start the season with him ahead of Simone as the lead backup for Lowry Markinen. Because Luca does a couple of things well that I like, and he's big, and I want to have a really tall roster if I'm the coach that's athletic and runs hard. Those are all pluses. And no knock on Simone, but Luca just might be better than he is, mm -hmm. which is why Luca was a first round draft pick a couple of years ago by the Spurs, and Simone Fontecchio was not. So, yeah, I thought Luca was fine. Uh, this is good for him. Yeah, yeah no, I think he's going to make the roster. I would be surprised if he didn't. So uh, I think there's something to work with there. So I don't think there was a lot of shots for Taylor to do it. And you know what? I would rather him not fall in love with the idea of shooting and be a little passive while other guys are on the floor. That's his role. That's fine. So no, no, worry about, no worries about Taylor Hendricks at all. Uh, check back with me on when I'm worried about Taylor Hendricks. It'll be uh, October 10th, 2025. If two years from now he stinks, I'm like, oof, that was a bad draft pick. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give him some room to develop. I'm not going to worry about his first 12 minutes on the NBA floor, my goodness. As you should. And I think that it's a good lesson for everybody to not overreact to preseason. You're going to see different rotations as soon as opening night comes along. Real quick, we can talk about Sensaba. Despite being cleared, I wasn't really expecting him to play, at least in that game against the Clippers. I don't know if he'll get any preseason minutes. What do you expect? Yeah, I was a little surprised he didn't play because he'd been cleared. But then at the same point when he didn't, I thought, oh, they must just be bringing him along slowly. Yeah. That was my that was my takeaway. I, I wish it was spicier than that. It's not. He just he's he's not yep. ready, so he's not playing. We can move on to the second year guys. Like I said, uh, Walker Kessler was going against Ivica Zubac, who's a veteran. He's definitely a bigger body, not as big as Brook Lopez or some other big centers, but he can definitely bang down low. 
right out the gate. He was dominant defensively, what we expect from Walker. He had three first quarter blocks and ended with five. Um, but I noticed he looked a little bit rusty on offense. I don't know if that's fair to say. He had trouble holding onto the ball on a few occasions, whether he was going for rebounds or rolling to the hoop. But it seemed like he sort of shook that off after the first quarter and then was you, what the Jazz needed. Do you have Walker's final stat line in front of you? Uh, yes, I do. Can you read it to me? Yes. Um, he finished with seven points, seven rebounds, three for five shooting, uh, one for three from the free throw line, um, and three offensive rebounds. Five blocks. Yes. So in the first half, Walker had one point. He had three rebounds, and he had three blocks. I mean, he was he was not good in the first half because he was playing against Zubats. Yes. And Zubats is good. And now, look, Zubats truly might be the 30th best starting center in the NBA or like 28th starting center in the NBA. Now, he does things that Walker struggles with. He's really strong. Yes. Walker does not like really strong guys. We saw it with Brooke Lopez. Brooke Lopez washed. Walker last year at, at the game when Milwaukee came into Salt Lake. Uh, Walker's still got to figure that out, and he's young, and he's not that strong yet, and that's going to be a part of his development. All of Walker's production came in the second half. Yes. All of it came in the second half. Six points, four rebounds, two additional blocks, the blocks he had in the first half. But, uh, yeah, and I don't I don't want to say I'm concerned about it. I'm not. It's preseason. Uh, but he, yeah, destroyed, who was it, Diabate? Who was the backup uh, center for the Clippers in this game, like it was not, it certainly was not uh, the best this the the Clippers had to offer. It was some Amir Coffee as well. Okay, so yeah, it wasn't a great performance. I didn't think from from Walker Kessler, and yeah. I'm again, I'm also not worried about it. Yeah, Musa Diabate uh, was who he he played well against in the second half. Well, he should dominate that guy. Yeah. That's a good sign. Yep, that's fine. Like dominate the guys who are worse than you. You're trying to figure out the guys who have been playing longer than you, and he will get there. I'm not worried about Walker Kessler. I just thought Ochai was pretty good. We're talking, talking about, about second-year players. And also talking about guys who are willing to let it fly. Yeah, I, and you know what? 0 for 4 from Ochai. I saw him shoot the heck out of the ball at Kansas. I saw him shoot the heck out of the ball the second half of the season last year. I saw him shoot the heck out of the ball during summer league. Like, I'm not worried about that in the slightest. I like that he grabbed three rebounds. Three fouls is probably too much. Got a steal. Uh, had a positive plus minus. Scored nine points. I thought Ochai actually looked pretty good. I was encouraged by that. Uh, and he started in the second half in place of uh, of Lowry Markin, who didn't play the final two quarters because he looked fine in the first half as well. Uh, I thought Ochai was good. I thought he knows what his role is. He didn't try and turn into a superstar and say, I'm going to take 35 shots. He did take 10 in, in 19 minutes, but I don't have a problem with that. Uh, I thought Ochai looked good. I thought he made good reads. Like, he just he ran well. He looks to me, to contrast this with a conversation we were already having, uh, where Keontae George was totally thinking in the first quarter, Taylor Hendricks was totally overthinking in the fourth quarter. Ochai was overthinking the whole first half of the season last year. Ochai looked like he was just playing mm-hmm. this season. That's a great, great growth. He yes. just looked like he was running and doing Ochai stuff and being athletic and taking open shots. And, yeah, he missed him. That's fine. Take four more tonight. Take ten. Take ten threes tonight, Ochai. I believe in you as a shooter. So I thought that was really promising. Um, and also talking about Clippers, Norman Powell, he's sort of like a Jordan Clarkson type, like mm-hmm. sit on the wing and get his shots off. Um, for a good amount of time, Ochai was on him. He finished 0 for 7 from the field um, with two turnovers. Yeah. Right. So that's like a guy who I'm not saying he's prime James Harden or anything, but that's a guy you don't expect to go 0 for 7. And Ochai played great defense on him. And that's what you expect from him at the end of the day. And if you want to play two way players. Like we talked about advocating for Chris Dunn. Let's say you think, well, Chris Dunn, Walker Kessler, John Collins, that's too many non-shooters. You could start Jordan Clarkson at the one and then put Ochai at the two and be big and athletic and still be able to shoot the ball. That's another option, I think, in the starting lineup, though. I, I staked my claim on Chris Dunn and, and uh, Jordan Clarkson being the starters. If they don't do it, maybe Ochai sneaks in there. All right, that's the game one recap. Obviously, next week we'll uh, recap what the uh, well, we'll have three more, I think, preseason games, at least two more preseason games by then. Uh, tonight and Saturday night. So we will we will talk about those. Uh, let's take a quick break. When we come back, we'll look at the GM survey. What did the NBA general managers have to say about the Utah Jazz? Stick around. Welcome back to the Jazz Notes podcast. Ben Anderson, Chandler Holt. Thanks for tuning in. As always, reading us at kslsports.com for all of our Utah Jazz coverage. GM survey, one of my favorite things they do every year in the NBA, a league that lacks candor. Uh, does this one fun thing every season. They they let the GMs vote on some of these funny questions of who's the best team, who's the hardest to project, who's the most athletic player, et cetera, et cetera, who's the best rookie, uh, and then we can go back and look at all the places they got it wrong. Jazz not mentioned all that much in this, uh, Chandler. Mm-hmm. Usually the Jazz are kind of littered all over this thing. Not many Jazz mentions. 
they did get a vote for what team will be most improved in the upcoming season, so I think that's kind of interesting. The top the- five teams, sorry, were Oklahoma City, Houston, Dallas, Detroit, and Orlando, and then Golden State, Indiana, the Lakers, the Pelicans, the Jazz all got votes. I think it's funny that Golden State and Los Angeles made this list, considering they were both playoff teams. Los Angeles made it all the way to the Western Conference Finals, but I guess that's just sort of a regular season record, I'm assuming. The Clippers were also voted... 40 or the, the Clippers won it last year got 41 percent what moves did the Clippers make last yeah. offseason was like they added John Wall you know what I mean yeah. like did they have a big offseason maybe I'm forgetting something mm-hmm. I think well I guess Norman Powell but like yeah I don't know much. I don't know why people thought they were gonna be great and they were not mm-hmm. so uh oh yeah Oklahoma City should be better this year I, I watched the game last night with Wemby and uh and Chet and Chet looks pretty good if he can stay healthy yes he's gonna help them and Oklahoma City should make the playoffs speaking of rookies uh who will win the 2023-2024 Rookie of the Year? Of course, at the top of that is Wimben Yama, Scoot and Chet coming up behind. And sorry if I mispronounced this, uh, Sasha Vazenkov got a vote for Rookie of the Year, but none of the Jazz rookies did. I find that interesting. Uh, but one Jazz rookie, or I guess two Jazz rookies actually were mentioned, and which rookie was the biggest steal at where they were selected in the draft? Keontae comes in at number, uh, he was tied for second with Scoot Henderson and Jaime Jaquez. Uh, with 10% of the vote, Cam Whitmore overwhelmingly got uh, the number one spot. Which is funny to me. It's like, yeah, he was the biggest steal. And also 19 of you guys passed on him. And I think you all passed on him for a reason. Yes. And there's been a lot of rumors. I don't want to repeat some of them because I don't know what's true. And that's not fair to Cam Whitmore. I root for all these kids coming in to make a billion dollars and play forever and have the time of their lives. So I hope I hope he does and plays well and figures it out in Houston. But it is funny to be like, oh, he was a steal before he's ever played a meaningful game. And it's like, well, then why did you draft him so late? Yeah. Just draft him higher. And everyone knew Cam Whitmore was like in the talk to go number four. So why he went number 20, still a little strange. Uh, Kente George was also talked about a lot as a top 10 pick throughout mm-hmm. the season and then slipped to the Jazz at 16. So uh, also should note, Bryce Sensabaugh got a vote here too, uh, being picked up at number 28. We'll see. I, again, I hope we see him tonight as the Jazz take on the Clippers again. I think that's cool to see. I don't know how a lot, I feel like he's sort of polarizing. I mean, he's not getting a lot of conversations around him, but like you said, he sort of has an interesting game. So to see that maybe at least a GM thinks that he could be the seal of the draft is good news. I bet it was Danny Ainge who <laughs> gave himself that vote uh, and probably also voted for uh, for Keontae as well. But I will say this, uh, you know, Bryce Sensabaugh was also a lot of mocks, even in March, yes. April, before we kind of recognized like the knee injury was keeping him out of... Uh, out of practices, and he wasn't able to get some of that that pre-draft buzz that a lot of guys generate. He was like very consistently talked about as the 14th pick, 13th pick. Jazz said they had him top whatever's 18 on their board or whatever. So uh, they liked it. They liked him too. A lot of teams liked him. He just got hurt late in the season and dropped to 28 as a result. Uh, which active player will make the best head coach someday? Uh, former Jazz man Mike Conley, second on that list. I okay. think that makes sense. Is Paul number one? Yes, he is. Yeah, he's always <laughs> number one on this list. Uh, yeah, I think Mike Conley would be very good. I don't know if he will coach, but uh, yeah. Mike Conley could be good there. And then which team has the best home court advantage? This is the other place the Jazz get mentioned. They come in at number four, 10% behind the Sacramento Kings, Golden State Warriors, and the Denver Nuggets. Honestly, I think that's the perfect spot for them. You have the Nuggets at number one who have the elevation, and then Golden State and Sacramento are both California teams that get absolutely wild. And then the Jazz also have that elevation advantage and some dedicated fans. Yeah, it's it's the right spot. Jazz are good every year at home, and they're going to be pretty good at home again this year. Should we get to the Jazz 50 real quick? Yeah, Do you sure. want to revisit that, the names we've touched on since uh, we last recorded the podcast? That was last Tuesday. Let me try and do this in reverse order. Uh, well, I'll just count back. We'll, we'll start with where we got today. Today, number 10, Andre Karolinko. Uh, yesterday, Monday, we had uh, Daryl Griffith. Last Friday, we had Mehmet Kerr at number 12. Thursday, Jeff Hornacek, number 13. Maybe the surprising low name on this mm-hmm. list. Uh, Jeff Hornis, or excuse me, Gordon Hayward came in on uh, Wednesday at 14, and then the last Tuesday we talked about Truck Robinson. There's an interesting conversation of which of those players is actually the best player between all four of those guys, Gordon Hayward, Andre Kirilenko, Mehmet Okur, and uh, Jeff Hornacek. That's why they're all so tightly packed together and, and near this top 10, and Andre Kirilenko of all those guys makes the top 10. I loved watching Andre Kirilenko play basketball. I'm sure this was a little bit before your time, Chandler, but... As far as just raw, exciting, highlight reel, pure talent, feel for the game, Andre Karolinko really had it all, I thought. I think AK-47 may have been a little bit before his time. Way before his time. Yeah, like he's right before that three-point wave hit the NBA, and he was sort of that stretch four. I would even go to far as say he might have been like Laurie Markkinen before Laurie Markkinen. Yeah, he wasn't as talented a scorer, certainly, and and nobody was shooting like that. Had he come into the league with this idea that, hey, I'm going to have to shoot more, okay. But he was a little bit of a, a shorter, 
not as strong Giannis Antetokounmpo. You know, I mean, he was yes. just kind of that, that he was, you know, Jonathan Isaac we've talked about who doesn't play a lot, but when he's on the floor, he's absolutely fabulous in Orlando. He was just that type of guy. Uh, so had he played in today's NBA, I think we would have appreciated his game a little bit more. All the different things he could do, guard four or five positions on the floor, can run the offense a little bit, rebound and go. Playing in space would have really benefited Andre Kirilenko. He was hurt by Jerry Sloan wanting to pack it in and play pick and roll with Darren and Boozer. And even though Memento cursed space the floor some, it certainly wasn't like it is today. The early 2010s is one of my favorite, like, basically the Heatles era is one of my favorite times yep. of NBA basketball. And then that's when you think of Gordon Hayward with the Jazz, specifically when he had his little bowl cut, the longer yep. hair. Um, definitely deserves to be top 15 on this list. Yeah, I, I agree. And I get that the way he left the team was icky, but uh, he, he was really good. And and the one thing he can you can say about Gordon that you can't say about Andre Kirilenko, you can't say about Mehmet Okur, and you can't say about Jeff Hornacek is he was the best player on a playoff team. He was by far the Jazz best player on two playoff teams, in fact, uh, including the one that beat the Los Angeles Clippers in the first round. So Gordon deserves to be on this list. It's too bad he's just a weirdo. He's a weird dude, so he's not that <laughs> likable. And that's totally fair. He is not that likable. Jazz always tried to paint him as like this like cool guy. He was not. He was not he was not super outgoing. He was an introvert, and even the parts of him that came out weren't all that flattering. You know, not he wasn't a bad guy. He just wasn't he wasn't that interesting. So uh Gordon Hayward, I think, hurt by his exit and uh, his overall personality. Moving on to the mailbag, we have two questions today. First up from Alpha Bunny. I'm assuming most GMs didn't have the same access to Whitmore as the ones that passed on him. Does that factor into how you would interpret the results? Yes, that is part of it where you see, you know, he works out for four teams and all these teams are like, well, we're not going to draft you, dude. We didn't work you out. Like, I don't know what the, and all we've heard is these horror stories of you, like, not being able to finish workouts. So... I don't know what they saw and why they passed on you, but if they had better picks than us and they passed on you, I better go with my my safer pick, and I'd rather be wrong about you and get a safer pick that I think is going to work out than take a flyer and have you have all these you know red flags that come in and sink the team, and then all of a sudden we didn't get anything in the draft, and now my job's on the line. So I think there was some weird injury stuff. I, he was not as good last year in college as I think he got made out to be. Like He couldn't pass the ball, didn't pass the ball at all. We will see. This is a weird... Houston team that the horrible story with Kevin Porter Jr. beating up his girlfriend. I'm glad he's out of the league. I don't think he's ever going to play another NBA game. Good. Don't need you. Uh, but the gross part about practically talking about it on the floor is that it's actually probably beneficial for the Rockets because they had a log jam of guys who want to shoot. Uh, Fred Van Vliet wants to shoot. Green wants to shoot. Whitmore's going to want to shoot. They've just got guys who are going to want to put put the ball up. Uh, and this actually just opens up more shots for Cam Whitmore. It might be good for his Rookie of the Year campaign. I think that that is something that a lot of people don't realize. He was projected top 10, but like you said, he's not going top five, so maybe he only works out with about five teams. Mm-hmm. And then once you get to the 11 through 20, those guy, those teams have already worked out guys and sort of made their mind probably between two or three of who they want to draft. And if they're not expecting to get you, they haven't worked out with you, they haven't talked with you, they're not going to draft you. Look, Danny Ainge loves talent more than anything. He loves super talented players. And has shown a willingness to like work with guys who have weird off the court issues before. He had no problem acquiring Kyrie Irving, who was even already getting a little into his strange phase. Like he's always been willing to do that a little bit. And he passed on Cam Whitmore twice, yes. so something was going on there. And again, I don't know the whole story. I wish I did. I've heard the rumors. I think everyone's seen him on Twitter. Uh, I don't know, but a couple of teams passed on him twice. Orlando passed on him twice. The Jazz passed on him twice. Another team had two picks in the top. 18 or 19 and passed on him twice like something happened yes that i think uh we haven't gotten the full story on but again i'm rooting for him i hope he cleaned it up i hope he matured i hope he can come in and have a lot of success with houston last question here from leo is ochai already able to be a starter it's a legit question after his great performance versus la uh, you know and again I, I praised him i don't know if he had a great performance uh if you started him i would totally understand why he does things that i'm not sure another player on the jazz does as well like he I think he has a chance to be a 37 percent to 40 percent three-point shooter which is rare not a lot of guys are doing that and jazz don't have a lot of those guys in the backcourt right now especially guys who are prolific shooters like Colin's a great shooter uh Chris Dunn has great shooting percentages they don't shoot threes Ochai will shoot 10 threes in a game this year yeah. but that's fine good you need a guy who will really get it up and then he doesn't need to dribble he doesn't care about dribbling he runs really hard and he plays defense to your point of against Norman Powell so those are things that he does that not a lot of players on the Jazz do, and that would be advantageous. And he was a former lottery pick. Like, it's not crazy to think he could start by year two. I'm not betting on it, but I think he's in the rotation. 
if Ochai and Jordan Clarkson weren't both such like strict two guards, I think that a lineup with both of them in there could work. You yeah. know, because Clarkson has his like all around scoring ability, and then Ochai sort of that three and D sort of mold. But neither of them you can really trust to run an offense. So I don't know about being a spar- starter with Jordan Clarkson. Yeah, happens. and and because they don't have like a full fully developed like floor general decision maker late game guy gonna run the offense when you have three bad possessions in a row he's just gonna step up and do what Mike Conley did last year and be like we're gonna run this set and we're gonna get a really good shot and it's gonna break our funk they don't have that they have a lot of guys who are thinking like well I can break this funk by myself (laughs) uh you probably can't put Ochai out there because he's not gonna generate a good shot on his own or run the offense on his own to your point in fact he really struggled trying to do it in the summer league so, you know, Chris Dunn, Keontae George are probably the two best point guards as far as passers go in the backcourt for the Jazz. Uh, and that's why I think one of those two guys is probably, that would be my odds on favor to start a point guard. I would say it's between Chris Dunn and Keontae George. Sorry, one more thing. We uh, teased and never touched on the Drew Holiday rumors. Oh, yes. Uh, speaking of point guards, and I think that's why it fits into talk here. It was not uh, necessarily asked, but uh, both Windhorst and Zach Lowe said uh, the Jazz sniffed around on Drew Holiday, and maybe had it been next year when it's so hard for these teams that are over the salary cap uh, once the new CBA kicks in and these new rules kick in, it would have been hard for those teams, basically impossible for those teams to get Drew Holiday. That's the type of trade the Jazz could have uh, could have won, essentially, and had the best package going out. My guess is the Jazz didn't throw a crazy, crazy package at him, uh, but other teams were able to because this is the last year to do it, so these championship contenders like Boston, like Philadelphia probably, like Miami, threw a lot at it and just had better packages than the Jazz. But interesting, the Jazz sniffed around, and they should. Yes. They've got the assets to improve the roster if they want to. I was playing around in the NBA Trade Finder, and uh, Colin Sexton and Olenek would have gotten it done contract-wise. Right, and I, I, you know, it might have even been like Taylor Horton Tucker— Kelly Olynyk and like whatever other seven million dollar contract you yes. have, and a first round pick, like a very highly protected first round pick. Yes, thinking like we don't need Drew Holiday is how Danny Ainge is viewing it, but we'll take him. Yeah. So if you want these pieces, these pieces are here for you, but we don't need him. And Boston's like, nah, we need him because <laughs> you guys just got Dame, and we need someone to guard Dame in the playoffs. And I think that's the right move. I think that Drew Holiday ahead of Keontae would have been extremely beneficial, though. I think that. Drew is a very smart player. Of course, he's probably the best perimeter defender in the NBA. Yep. And just having being able to learn from a guy like that would be huge. Agreed. I also think he would have signed somewhere else next season, yes. and then you would have been like, well, oh, we traded all this stuff for <laughs> one year of Drew Holiday. Which is, you know, or maybe, the, honestly, the Jazz may have brought in Drew Holiday to play for six months and trade him at the trade deadline. I mean, that's True. a very Danny Ainge move. Yeah. <laughs> so that might have been the interest there is, hey, let's buy low. If you could buy low on him, and they ended up not buying, I mean, he sold for a huge price. That was they got a lot for him, I thought. But uh, you know, if you could buy him at a reasonable price and resell him at the deadline for exactly what Boston gave up for him, you would have been like, well, that's just good GM work. Yes. that might have been a lot of what the Jazz were doing. Thank you guys for tuning into the Jazz Notes podcast. You can come back every Tuesday afternoon. That's when we're going to be posting them anywhere that you get your podcasts. Yep. Uh, find us on Twitter at Ben's Hoops at Chandler Holt KSL, and of course, read us at KSLSports.com. Be back for the next Tuesday. <laughs>